What's going on everybody? So I've wanted to talk about something for very long on this channel. I've referenced it many times and you've seen some of my movie tickets before. And that is of course my movie ticket collection. I've been collecting movie ticket stubs since 2001. I slowed down a little bit once I started getting invited into screenings because they don't really give you tickets for those and so but there's a lot of memories in here and I'm excited to share some of them with you. I'm basically going to pick and choose which tickets I talk about. Some of them might have more interesting stories than others but really it's just kind of fun to look back on the old movie ticket styles, theaters that aren't around anymore, how they used to be printed, and even more so the prices that they used to be. So let's have some fun. Take a trip with me down memory lane. So the very first ticket I have, you can barely tell what it is. It's for a Gary Sinise movie called Imposter. It's from 2001. You can barely make out the date because it had been caught in my pocket when it was washed. And that's the earliest one I've got. After that is The Time Machine starring Guy Pearce. This film was actually directed by H.G. Wells' great-grandson. This one also got caught in the wash, I can see, but that was summer 2001. So th these were some of the earliest PG-13 movies that I was allowed to see in theaters. I turned 13 that year, and my dad finally lifted his stupid no PG-13 rule, so that was really exciting for me. I have two tickets for Lord of the Rings Two Towers because it was just so amazing and I had to see it again. Minority Report was one of the three films I saw in 2002 that really just made me realize my love of movies. It was the very first time that I ever had sort of a serious discussion about a film afterwards because my friends were all JWs but my one friend's dad who took us was not. And afterwards he talked to me about Steven Spielberg's filmography. And I realized I was having an hour long discussion about a filmmaker with someone who was actually interested in talking about that. And that had never happened before. Whenever I went to movies with my friends, it was always like, okay, yeah, that was fun, but let's go play N64 or GameCube or whatever and just forget about it. This was the first time that I ever really had an actual discussion about film and what it could mean or what it was for Spielberg's filmography. And I got a taste of what actual film discussion was like. I saw signs in theaters five times. I only have two tickets from those experiences, but as you know, that was the one. That was it. Okay, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm doing this. This is what I want to do. And I was only 14 and didn't really know what that meant. And when you get that initial spark, you're like, oh, well, that's just what I'm doing. You're so naive and you're so oblivious to the realities of it, but you know it's what you're doing no matter what. No one's going to stop you. And that's exactly how I felt after seeing that movie. And the other film that year, along with Minority Report and Signs, was Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. There's very few times when you're watching a movie that you just kind of forget about everything. You forget about the world, you forget about your problems, and you really do get sucked into an experience and it feels real to you. And Sam Raimi's Spider-Man did that for me. Bruce Almighty was a fun theater experience. The entire theater caved in with laughter, especially the scene where Jim Carrey forces Steve Carell to say all kinds of things on air is some of the loudest theater laughter I've ever experienced in my life. Willard, starring Crispin Glover, is a pretty underrated movie and a fantastic performance by him. Laura Croft, Cradle of Life. Angelina Jolie, Tomb Raider. Those were some good times. Ang Lee's Hulk. I remember fucking loving that when I saw it. I was, what was I, 15? Yeah, I was 15. I remember thinking this was amazing. It gave me everything I wanted. Over the years, I was like, this movie's about 30 minutes too long, and I really am not a fan of the comic book panels, transitions, and all that, but um, I do like what Ang Lee tried to do. You can see the attempt. You can feel the artistic attempt. It just doesn't always work. Secret Window was another big one for me, and over the years I've always found myself enjoying it, and I often listen to the score for it while I write. It just has a lot of qualities that I love about horror and thrillers. It's a character study, it has a great lead performance by Johnny Depp, it has a really satisfying ending in my opinion, and I've always loved Secret Window. I saw Dodgeball Friday, June 18th, and the very next day, Saturday, because I laughed so hard watching that stupid movie that I had to go experience it again. I, I miss comedies like that. Spider-Man 2, what can I say? It's an amazing superhero film. I saw that, let's see, one, two, three times in pretty quick succession. Alien vs. Predator, not a great movie, but honestly, um, not as bad as people say and not as bad as people were concerned about. 
I said this in my review for it. It's a PG-13 movie, which was annoying, but it was better than the R-rated sequel. The Village was my most anticipated movie of all time back then. I could not wait to see it. I've done the review. You guys know how I feel about the movie. There's so much I love about it, and I still do rewatch the film uh, fairly often, actually, maybe at least once a year. And it kind of gives me the type of vibes I want when I think about writing horror. Um, there's aspects of it that don't work, but that's normal. That's That happens all the time. Hero, starring Jet Li. I am so glad I saw that movie in theaters because it is gorgeous. It's one of my favorite martial arts epics. Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, Wednesday, 12.01 a.m. Damn, that was fun. I remember there was an Obi-Wan. I think there was a little Yoda in the theater. I mean, people were pumped, you know, and this is, this is still after a period where people felt kind of disappointed by the prequels. People were very excited for it. And I really liked it. And I still really like Revenge of the Sith. It was clearly like the movie George Lucas wanted to make the whole time. And you could really feel it. And the theater could too. And I saw it again three days later on the 21st of May. And then I saw it again uh, June 3rd. I saw that at midnight again at a local theater here in Kent. Uh, I missed, they used to do midnight showings like on the weekends, but COVID kind of put a stop to that, unfortunately. But that's also a really good memory because I got to see it for the first time that time with uh, one of my best friends. Of course, we were still JWs, but he later left and now we're still friends, which is great. And it's cool to have that memory with him. This ticket that just says Batman is obviously Batman Begins. I told my friends at the time, let's go see this movie. And they were concerned about the last one, which had starred Clooney. They thought, eh, I think I'm done with Batman movies. And I said, look, I had seen like a TV edited version of Memento. I had seen a TV edited version of Insomnia. And I was like, look, I think, um, I think this might be good. And I loved it. And my friend who doubted it going in actually loved it even more than me at the time. So, yeah, uh, seeing Batman Begins for the first time was fucking crazy. Oh, and then I saw Revenge of the Sith again three days later. <laughs> I saw Revenge of the Sith four times in theaters. Wow, that's awesome. Spielberg's War of the Worlds was also a really fun theater experience. I think people were really into it. There's parts of it that don't hold up as much. Um, a lot of people seem to hate the ending, even though like I, I knew what the ending was. It's just, it's the ending of War of the Worlds. It's just the way it is. There are moments in, in that film that are brilliant. I think the, the build-up, the first act especially, is fucking phenomenal. I am so glad I saw Wes Craven's Red Eye in theaters. That was a really fun time. Definitely one of his last really good movies. Rest in peace, man. Walk the Line. Man, James Mangold, honestly, I could do a whole video about James Mangold. He is maybe like the most underrated, giant well-known filmmaker who really isn't that well-known because he's made a, a good movie in virtually every genre. Walk the Line is like musical biopic, drama, Logan, Wolverine, Identity, Kate and Leopold, his indie drama Heavy, Ford v. Ferrari. I mean, like, there's no surprise that he got Indiana Jones 5. He can really do it all. Eon Flux. Yeah, I saw that. Moving on. Pride and Prejudice. I remember going to see that by myself because that was the period where like all my friends were still like, oh, you're going to go see like a movie for girls. And I was like, I don't give a shit. I'm going to go see it. Leave me alone. And it was really good. It was really fucking good. King Kong. I still really enjoy a lot of that movie. I think there's some, some real brilliance there. Eight Below. Man, rest in peace, Paul Walker. That was one of the Paul Walker's better films, I thought. If you haven't seen Eight Below, it's basically like a guy who's stranded with a bunch of fucking snow dogs or something, and Cuba Gooding Jr.'s not in this one. Uh, but it's... it's <laughs> Mission Impossible 3. Man, that was a really fucking great theater watch. But Mission Impossible 3, unfortunately, suffered from Tom Cruise's image at the time, which was stupidly exaggerated by the tabloids, but uh, was definitely better than two. And Abrams found a really good tone for it. It has a lot of great action sequences. Nacho Libre. <laughs> Nacho fucking Libre. Um, look, definitely wouldn't be made today. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I would be lying if I didn't like 
quote that movie all the time. <laughs> Lady in the Water. Oh, man. I mean, I reviewed the movie. You guys know. Again, very anticipated. And again, there are moments of brilliance in it, despite some other things. But um, I saw that at 11.40 p.m. That's right. I was working at Walmart at the time. I remember, <laughs> I remember asking my boss. I was like, I have to get off early enough to go see Lady in the Water. <laughs> <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Uh, disappointing compared to the first, but honestly, not not a bad movie. It's got a lot of it's got a lot of uh, really fun sequences, and Johnny Depp is great in it. Casino Royale. Oh my God! I am so glad that I was like old enough to kind of like get it, you know, and and feel excited about that movie and and just be there for that film. That is going to be one of those movies where. I'm just always going to remember seeing that for the first time and just being fucking blown away by it. The Fountain, Darren Aronofsky's film. I, I really like this movie and I go back to it a lot. A lot of people don't because it doesn't make sense a lot of times. And it's like, what does that mean? It's like just a bunch of paintings. I have always loved it. I find it very uh, ethereal. There, I said a big word. I can move on. <laughs> Rocky Balboa. I saw that movie twice in just two days. Yeah, two days back and forth. Uh, that film really surprised me. Um, I hadn't really been a huge Rocky fan. I had seen them. I enjoyed a lot of them, but I expected nothing from it. It just felt like a strange late period sequel that just wasn't a good idea. But it was. It's really good. Rocky Six technically is is actually one of my favorite Rocky movies. Disturbia was cool because for me it felt like my dude from Even Stevens was getting into the big leagues and the Disney Channel original film True Confessions, and suddenly he's in a Rear Window esque thriller and it was actually pretty good. Live Free or Die Hard. Yet again, another big surprise. That movie uh, had nothing but bad press. <laughs> going into it, mostly because of the rating. But it was good. It was actually really good. Die Hard 4 is good. Transformers was one of those cultural experiences. Somehow it just felt like the world had shifted, even though it was just robots and Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> the Bourne Ultimatum, oh my god. That was awesome. I loved seeing that in theaters, uh, because I hadn't seen the first two in theaters. I had become a fan of them on DVD. So getting a chance to really see what is still, in my opinion, the best Bourne film in a giant crowd on the big screen, yeah, I'll never forget that. Cloverfield, one of the best January movies of all time. I'm reminded it was a January film. Most of the hype for that movie was because of an incredible ARG internet campaign. Indiana Jones 4, yeah, I saw that in theaters, of course. Yeah. And here's my first MCU tickets. I have Iron Man and The Incredible Hulk right next to each other. Seeing Iron Man in theaters was crazy because I didn't know anything about the character. I had only seen him in some of the cartoons I used to watch. And the ending scene, I remember when Samuel L. Jackson shows up as Nick Fury, uh, I had a friend with me who was obsessed with the comics and he was, he was losing his goddamn mind. And I won't lie, I had no idea who the fuck that was. So I was just like, what, what, What's, what, what is it? And he was like, dude, do you have any idea what that means? And I was like, I don't know what it fucking means. I know what it means now. The X-Files, I want to believe. Man, that could have been. Man. Damn it. Now we have a giant collection of Dark Knight tickets because I saw the Dark Knight in theaters, I think, four times. I have three of them right here for sure. <sighs> what what hasn't been said? Uh, it's, it's a great movie, obviously. It's a good, it, Dark Knight's a pretty good movie, just in case you didn't know. Oh, Paul Blart Mall Cop. Glad I saved that one. Taken was another big surprise. My friends and I all went to see that. Afterwards, we got food, and we were still sort of on a high from it because we just didn't expect anything out of it. I think that really helped that movie a lot. 500 Days of Summer. The first time I ever drove way out of my way to see a movie. I drove like 45 minutes to see that film because it wasn't playing anywhere near me and I loved it. I, I, it's still one of my favorite romantic comedies. And there it is, there's Ponyo, the first movie I ever reviewed on YouTube. There was a special Halloween re-release of E.T., so I got to see that in theaters, which of course was just amazing, especially to hear John Williams score in a theater. 
Avatar. That was definitely a theater movie. It has never been better at home. And I saw it in like every format. I saw it in IMAX. I saw it in 3D. I saw it in 2D. I got to see The Princess Bride in theaters. Yeah, that was great. The theater, you could feel the theater like wanting to quote lines. They wanted to like get to that point where they were going to say a line. But most people were pretty respectful because I hate when people do that. Ah, furry vengeance. Yet another ticket I've saved. Toy Story 3. I saw that Friday at 12.15 a.m., a theater filled with adults. <laughs> and everyone was just weeping. Inception, a packed midnight showing. I somehow was able to sit in the exact center of the theater. I still have like the visual of the, the people around me during the hallway scene and just feeling like I was watching something revolutionary. The Social Network, oh my God, yeah. I saw that with a buddy of mine at the time and he was like, yeah, it was fine. And I just, I remember going on and on about the dialogue and how well written it was and 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 that was when I started to notice like a real disconnect between me and some of my JW friends because I was talking more about film in a sort of way and, and they were kind of like yeah that passed the time can we do something else and um, I remember that rift really starting around this time period I loved seeing Jaws in a theater and what I loved even more about that showing it was at Cedar Lee it was actually a film print. There was damage, there was hairs on the frame, there was a little piece of broken film, like you, it would occasionally shake. It was just awesome. It felt like I was in 1975. Scream 4, Wes Craven's last movie. Once again, rest in peace. The Avengers. So yeah, I saw it at a screening, but I also went and saw it again. It's The Avengers, what do you want me to say? It's a big old movie. <laughs> That's my quote for the Blu-ray. The Avengers is a big old movie. There. Put it on the Blu-ray. The Dark Knight Rises, I also saw that at a screening, but I went and saw it again with my mom. I still really like that movie. It's not as good as The Dark Knight, and it's got issues, but I mean, I, I, it's great. I think it's great. Fuck it. I got to see Rear Window at Playhouse Square in Cleveland, which was really amazing. They had the red curtain go back. There was somebody playing an organ. They even showed it in the 4x3 aspect ratio, and that was also a film print. So... Getting the chance to do something like that in Cleveland is rare, and I'll never forget that. When Raiders of the Lost Ark was re-released in IMAX, of course I went and saw it. I mean, it's a movie you've seen a thousand times, and you've seen the pan and scan VHS, you've seen the letterboxed VHS, the DVD and the Blu-ray, but seeing it in theaters is a different, it's just different. I actually have some of my TIFF tickets from 2012 saved, so I have Looper and Dread. Oh my God, Dread. TIFF Midnight Madness, seeing Dread. Once again, a humongous surprise. Sinister, uh, that's definitely one of the scarier films I've ever seen. Seeing Before Midnight in theaters felt pretty special because I had only seen the original two on DVD and they're probably my favorite romance films. And so I was, I was very, I was like, oh man, let's complete this trilogy with flying colors. And he did, uh, all three of them are excellent. Oh man, Seeing the Wind Rises. At the time, thought to be Hayao Miyazaki's last film. He is working on something now. Let's hope that that all works out. But, you know, what, 2014? Jesus Christ, that was eight years ago when we thought it was his last movie. What a great movie. Under the Skin, I saw it twice. Jonathan Glazer makes like a movie a decade or something, and it's almost always something really special. Right around 2014, I stopped saving tickets. It was just becoming a bit of a hassle to kind of remember to save them, but also I was going to more screenings and they don't give you tickets at screenings. And so I started again in 2017, 2018-ish because I have tickets here for Split and John Wick. There were certain memories I wanted to save and seeing Split, I wanted to be like, all right, great M. Night Shyamalan movie. And I knew I had to save the tickets for those. I saw Halloween, the original in theaters in 2019, but I also saved other types of tickets. Like my wife and I saw Beetlejuice in New York, the play, which was just fucking incredible. I loved seeing that. I mean, those act, oh my God, those actors are so fucking talented. And now we get into actually after the pandemic, uh, Demon Slayer, the movie. I, I kind of just started up again recently because I don't know if it was like having kids or something and I was feeling a little more like saving memories and remembering uh, that time more. And we're jumping back a few years here because I had a ticket that I found and then later put in the book, but I did get to see the Cowboy Bebop movie in theaters 
when it was re-released for a showing. There's certain things where it's like, I need to see that in a theater if I can, if I ever can. And there's still a handful of movies I haven't gotten to see in a theater that I would love to, like Hook, Temple of Doom, and Last Crusade are three big ones for sure, but Cowboy Bebop movie was another. And recently I had to save my ticket for Spider-Man No Way Home because it just felt like connective tissue to Sam Raimi's film, and it all just, you know, gave me those feelings. And I got to see The Matrix when it was re-released when Resurrections came out. And I went to my childhood theater. There were two childhood theaters. One of them has been torn down, Plaza 8 Cinemas, Chapel Hill, rest in peace. But the Regal on Independence in Cuyahoga Falls is still there. And I would go there all the time too. And so I, I went there to see The Matrix because I had never gotten to see it as a kid in theaters. Those are some highlights from my movie ticket collection. Obviously, I didn't go through every single one. That would be dumb. That would take forever. There would be so much to talk about, but it was fun to, to kind of take that trip down memory lane with you guys, and I hope you enjoyed seeing seeing those. I know a lot of you also save movie tickets. I've had a lot of people tell me that. So I don't know. I just think it's like a really great way of making a time capsule about so many things. It's not just what movies you saw. It's the prices. It's the time of day you saw it. It's, it's the day you chose to see it, and it can bring back memories of who you saw it with and I don't know. I, I love looking at these every once in a while, and I wanted to share some of that with you. So thank you so much, as always, for watching, guys. Look forward to more videos very soon. If you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.